Hello, everybody. Welcome to Convergence. You're watching CVG TV. My name is Gregory Parks, and this is Conlink. I would like to welcome our next guest, one of our guests of honor. He is the director of the Vatican Observatory. He has a PhD from the University of Arizona, was a postdoctorate fellow at Harvard and MIT. Please welcome Brother Guy Consolmagno. Hello, Brother Guy. How are you doing? Doing great. Great to talk to you guys. Beautiful. It's great to see you. So <clears throat> people have, because of fantasy, because of fantasy and speculative fiction, we have this idea of a church astronomer uh, being somebody who's in a tower with a telescope. What is the reality of your position and the reality of your work? <laughs> they actually had a tower with a telescope about 100 years ago. <laughs> uh, towers are a terrible place to put a telescope because they shake so much. So in 1865, there was a Jesuit priest who was an astronomer who put the telescope instead on the roof of a church in Rome. And it was a church that was supposed to have a big dome and they ran out of money. So oh. there are all these pillars to support the, the, the dome and no dome. So he put the telescope on one of the pillars. And he did fantastic things. His name was Angelo Secchi. His 200th birthday would have been last year. He was the first guy to observe Mars and try to figure out what were the things on its surface. So he actually discovered the dark markings that people sometimes call canals. Uh, he saw the real things, though. He actually saw the real things. He was the first guy to take spectra of stars and figure out what those were. Oh, cool. At the time, uh, the Vatican was still fighting to be independent of Italy. So having a national observatory was a sign of nationhood. Also, at the end of the 19th century was the first time that people started saying that there might be a, a conflict between science and church. And so in 1893, Pope Leo XIII said, we're going to have a national observatory. Number one, it'll get us people to see that we're nations. And number two, show the world that, hey, the church supports science. So my job now is to go around the world representing the Vatican City State, and beyond that, do good science. So I just get, get to do whatever good science I want to do. <laughs> Marvelous. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that because people still, there still is to this day in the 21st century, the idea that science and religion are continually at odds. Uh, and you know, as long as people have that idea, I have a job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so um, what is your response to that? How do you counteract that idea? Because there are, there are essays by luminaries in science that discuss, that, that address that, about that yeah. science and religion don't have to be at odds, but yet here we are in the 21st century, people still have that idea. How do you respond to that and how do you address well, that in your work? Yeah. Um, well, the first thing is to give the soundbite answer about, you know, religion and, and science. My religion tells me that God made the universe. My science tells me how he did it. So you need both. Yeah. And the other is just to remind people that there were plenty of devout scientists who managed to do good science. Uh, the, the name people love to bring up is George Lemaitre, who is the fellow who invented the Big Bang Theory. Mm -hmm. And he was a Catholic priest from Belgium. But if that's too obscure, I'll mention two names that everybody listening to this has probably heard of, Mr. Ampere and Mr. Volta. <laughs> and amps and volts were both devised by people who happened to be, you know, very devout Catholics. Marvelous. So there, there's even, even with this prevailing idea, there are scores of examples of scientists throughout history that, as you said, were devout and also pursued science as a means of explaining, of explaining or understanding the world around them, explaining yeah, how uh, things work. It, indeed, um, I argue that being religious gives you the excuse to be a scientist. Um, <laughs> if you say that God made the universe and studying the universe is a way of getting close to God, and that's got a very practical effect, that point of view, it means, number one, you should never be afraid of what you find in the universe because truth doesn't contradict truth. And number two, it's a great excuse for getting support to do the science we do from whatever religion people belong to. If they believe in a religion that says, 
you know, the creator is somebody you want to be in touch with. Yeah, it's so they, they don't have to be exclusive. It's not a zero sum situation. Yeah, I, clearly, clearly. Beautiful. So <clears throat> with uh, your work, uh, how all of this work that you've done, how does it feel to have an asteroid named after you? Because <laughs> that is, that is yeah, that, not, not that many that. living people have that honor, have that experience. How does it feel? Well, I, as I tell people, you know, they made an asteroid out of me. Um, <laughs> I, I was able to tell my dad that, you know, you're not getting any grandkids out of me, but at least you've got the asteroid out there. Um, <laughs> it's a pretty obscure asteroid, I have to say. And the other thing is, in the field of planetary science, almost everybody has an asteroid after a while because there are like you know, 500,000 asteroids out there. And there certainly aren't even 500,000 planetary scientists. But I'd, I'd much rather have an asteroid than a crater. Ah. And that's because in order to have a crater named after you, you've got to be dead three years. Oh. Ah. I was, I was unaware of that. So did you have to, a crater naming is posthumous, but right. you can, you can be name alive asteroids and have for an almost asteroid. anything. Oh, excellent. Hmm. Maybe some of our uh, attendees will. Pursue getting an maybe asteroid. Maybe some of them already. Them. Yeah, maybe some of them already do. Even better. Well, as you said, because there aren't that many planetary scientists, but there's right. at least half a million asteroids out there. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> now, another part of your work was surrounding the some of the biggest science, some of the biggest astronomy news in several decades, the reclassification of Pluto. Uh, some, saw right. it as, some of it saw it as the demotion of Pluto. Pluto is no longer a planet. Uh, now, you, you, if, you think that, if you think that being a planet is somehow better than being something else, you're guilty of planetism. <laughs> Pluto Planetary is privilege. what it is. And... Uh, you know, when people thought it was a planet, it was kind of an ugly duckling of a planet. But now we realize there's a whole new class of objects. And it is the premier example of that. So it's much happier now that it's found its family and friends. <laughs> it, is, it is, as it were, uh, probably the, uh, the spearhead, the leader, the, the big star of, <clears throat> of that classification. Exactly. Exactly. It <laughs> and uh, would you explain what that classification is and then what led to the reclassification or the inclusion of Pluto in this new classification? Okay. Um, the important thing of why we classify objects is to be able to have a useful way of finding similar objects you could compare it against. And with Pluto and about five other objects, we realized these were bodies big enough that they could pull themselves into a sphere under their own gravity. So they're big enough to have geology going on, but small enough that they might have their orbits pulled around by the bigger planets. And in particular, Pluto's orbit is controlled by Neptune. If Pluto somehow were perturbed out of its orbit, Neptune would pull it back. It wouldn't pull on Neptune very much to, to do anything, but Neptune, Neptune's gravity is so much bigger that it would pull it back. And this means it was probably formed in a different way than Neptune and, and Uranus and the other planets out there. And that means if you want to have an idea of how it's formed, you have to use different physics. And if you want to find other bodies to compare it against, you have to have a different set of bodies that are similar to it and very different from Uranus and Neptune. So that was really, it was just a practical sense that uh, finding like-sized bodies that might have a similar kind of origin and a similar kind of evolution so you can compare one against the other. Beautiful. And in the keepings of science and scientific method, if you discover that what you have known is different than you think, then you change. And you, exactly. This is, and you adapt. You, know, you adopt that new knowledge and change, and it informs your understanding. Different, differently informs your understanding. Bingo. Exactly. Beautiful. Which is one of the which is one of the main tenets of science. One of the That's reasons exactly. so much mm -hmm. so much credit is given to science and the scientific method. And I also point out that 
a lot of science is simply organizing data. You collect the data, then you organize it. You know, a uh, hundred years ago, you'd write it on little three by five cards and sort it and file it. Now we use Excel spreadsheets, but it's still sorting and filing. And sorting and filing is sometimes called clerical work. And why was it called clerical? Because it was originally done by clerics. <laughs> and so it goes right back to the, you know, if you, if you look at who was doing the science in the 17th and 18th and even early 19th centuries, mm -hmm. more often than not, it would be the reverend so-and-so. Because in those days, you know, who else had the education and the free time and knew how to sort and file data. Marvelous. Well, thank you for all this insight. Uh, before, before I go, one last thing as we wrap up. Uh, what is your favorite thing about attending conventions? What do you look mo forward to most? Well, of course, it's really to meet friends. Um, I have an awful lot of friends in fandom. I've been involved in fandom since I was a student at MIT, which is more years ago than I want to admit, but you know, approaching 50, which is kind of scary. And uh, one of the things I love to do is to be a place, you know, the fans who come to science fiction conventions like Convergence, a lot of them are writers or writer wannabes or just people who want to have more knowledge about whether it's, you know, the Middle Ages for fantasy or astronomy for science fiction. And I can give a little bit of that because I do the science so I can tell people about planets which is where, where people have adventures. And I also live in an institution that's pretty darn medieval. So I can talk <laughs> about that too. Beautiful. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, calling in and chatting with us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at Convergence. So thank you. Have a good day. This is going to be great. I look forward to getting up there. Beautiful. Thank you for joining us. My name is Gregory Parks, and you are watching Conlink.